Good. Thank you so much, Mary, for, for hosting and coordinating here for us. Um, well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining me today as we talk about AI as ally, using design and AI to craft original content. My name is Megan Ree, and I'm an assistant professor in the Yale Gordon College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Baltimore and director of the MFA and Integrated Design program there. I'd like to spend our brief time together today focusing on a four-week experiment and a graduate-level brand development course that I taught in the fall of 2024. The aim of these four weeks was for graduate students in graphic design to view generative AI as a potential tool to aid their work rather than something to be afraid might replace them in the field that they're currently studying. As we begin, it's probably helpful to understand the way the course is structured and who's involved in the course. So this course includes graduate students in both our MA and MFA programs in integrated design. Students here have a wide variety of backgrounds entering the program with some having graphic design and visual communication experience, but oftentimes students are what we say have backed their way into industry, meaning that they uh, come with more of a visual uh, or a communications or a business background and not a traditional art or BFA. Our program goal is to develop portfolio level work, and this was a mid-level elective course. This course in particular had 16 total students enrolled and was taught in a mixed modality, meaning that I had seven students joining the course via Zoom and nine students present in the room with me at that time. In-room participants were asked to bring their own devices for this three-week working session. And additionally, our courses meet once a week for two and a half hour time blocks, so we could structure this longer working sessions into the course schedule. This particular project came at week 10 in the semester, and we ran it from week 10 through week 13. Students were working on additional projects outside of class, so this particular experiment was conducted more as a design sprint or in-class assignment over the course of three working weeks with one week for presentation. This meant that students were limited in terms of time and access to the generative tools, but I found that to be a benefit and not a detriment to their outcomes. Additionally, we'd already been modeling group work in the first 10 weeks of the semester, and so they were used to being placed into small collaborative groups and working together in class. Uh, let's take a broad look um, of what the kind of the core work weeks of that course look like um, and how we move through the work, and then I'll take a bit of a deeper dive into each week as then look at final outcomes. So the first week of the project was introduced and students were tasked with beginning to use text generative tools such as ChatGPT or Bing Chat. In week two, students continued to refine and hone the pre-generated text and then began to work in image generative programs such as Dolly, Bing Image Creator, and Adobe Firefly. In week three, students began uh, or spent time refining and finalizing their work as well as creating full mock-ups and preparing for presentation week. In week four, teams were asked to share their work through a brief presentation to their peers. As a note here, I did not require or restrict generative tools uh, that could be used. Instead, we made suggestions of options and encouraged students to look at free and accessible programs. Final tool usage varied by group and previous experience with those tools. Um, and in regards to previous experience with the generative AI tools, I will say that it was pretty mixed um, in the writing tools, meaning that some had tried it and others were totally opposed to it. Um, some said they actively used it. Others said they had done it once or twice, uh, kind of a deal. And then when we get to the image generative tools, almost none of them had experience or had considered using those tools um, at that point in time. So in terms of AI usage, I would think most of my students would have qualified themselves as novice at best at this time. So starting with week one, the project introduction and the use of AI as a brainstorming tool. So prior to class, I had randomly assigned people to either pairs or groups of three. We spent about 90 minutes that evening working through the project intro and the initial AI as a um, as a writing and brainstorming tool. We started with the prompt that you can see on the screen. It's simply to, in teams, collaborate to create a typographic title lockup or brand for a fictitious Netflix series. They were to use all generative AI tools to complete the project and try to not edit or add their own writing or design works. Even though they could, they weren't supposed to. Um, I provided design specifications as I would in any other design assignment and then put them into the groups to begin to work. And we'll note at this point that I knew that creating a typographic title lockup was probably going to be a challenge for where the generative AI was at that moment, but I didn't really want them to know that just yet. So as the project moved, um, we did ebb and flow as we discovered the limitations of the tools um, and allowed some editorial control, um, again, focusing on that AI as tool and collaborator. Um, so once they got into project groups, the initial task was to determine a genre for their new show. This is where teams had some choice um, before we moved into using the tool. They got to select um, and then move forward. Then we turned to the generative AI programs, particularly chat, GPT, and Bing chat to learn more about both Netflix and their selected genres. 
So after some initial prompts, we paused and shared prompts and things that were working um, and where their pain points were. At this point, we kind of broke in the ice with using some of the tools, um, and, but we wanted to get into further using it as a collaborator instead of something that would tell us what to do. So from there, I asked students to try to move from telling the AI to do something to seeing it as an ally or a collaborative tool. We did this by changing our prompt language and going from things like write this or do that to ask me questions to create this description. This kind of prompt uh, from my perspective is what stopped my students from that kind of standard, just do the work for me and moved us into looking at AI as a way to help them brainstorm, collaborate or think about things that maybe they hadn't initially thought of. Additionally, by this point, where students were using their own individual computers and we're learning that the AI isn't uniform even when asked the same question um, and that based on their histories and algorithms, the AI would ge generate different um, and related uh, answers to that, which is also an interesting conversation about biases um, and preferences and echo chambers within the tools. Uh, students then tried to use uh, those prompt questions to brainstorm um, and support to writing personas for their shows. I think I missed that in there. In there. Um, the personas in there. Um, and so we moved from creating audiences and personas to writing show descriptions. Students asked the AI, what do you need to know to write a short description of a show for Netflix? And then they would answer those questions, um, having conversation back and forth. They moved through revising and, and uh, audience descriptions and tried to iterate until they could capture something that they as a team agreed would work. Um, and again, they were told not to edit the AI language, but to try to, um, to edit through prompting only. We ended that night on the fun note of trying to brainstorm names for their new show. And again, students were encouraged to use only generative AI and rephrasing of prompts and language that had been generated previously to do so. Um, and they started by asking the AI to create 50 potential names um, for their new show and then to hone in from there. As a note, 50 was not an arbitrary number for this group. In previous assignments, they've been asked to brainstorm 50 names or to sketch 50 identities, um, 50 feeling like an unattainable and frustrating number for many of them along the way. Um, through this process, they expressed a lot of surprise and intrigue at how fast the AI could get to 50 and how it might help them to increase or push their own thinking um, beyond for some of the more obvious solutions. Um, in week two of the experiment, we actually had a little bit more time in class, and so we took a minute to step back and talk about the role of generative AI and its evolving uh, place within the graphic design field. First, we discussed how to or should uh, AI get credit when it comes to graphic design work in particular, and how in the industry, graphic designers aren't often attributed to their work to begin with. We looked at what MLA and APA styles say in terms of citation, but again, those aren't typical within our field. So we had conversations about how we can and should uh, be giving credit to AI where we had seen that in exhibitions and in academic and professional settings, how that they might be different. Um, we were able to have a conversation about academic integrity and where and how to identify those works um, and AI tools through acknowledging and tracking a prompt language that the work generated. There was discussion on ethics and where generative tools are training and grabbing the works from and how we should watch for ethical usage in the programs we select. This also led to some discussions of just because we can, should we, uh, before we moved into kind of talking about the role of prompt artistry. We talked about the importance of language and understanding of historical movements in the design and communication field to be able to use the AI as a productive, not time sucking tool. We talked about garbage in and garbage out and how they needed to apply critical thinking and writing skills to their prompt language. We also added that students should save their prompt language and use it when crediting the works they might produce in this tool. They were encouraged not to stop at first prompt results, but to draft, rewrite, and ask the AI to help them craft better language. We broke into groups and students were asked to review their writing they had created that week and uh, week before um, and see if they could quickly use the AI tools to revise any rough spots. We then attempted to get show descriptions down to 280 characters, which is roughly what Netflix show teasers allow to be seen. This showed limitations in editing and understanding of parameters within the tools. And at this point, they all wanted to intervene, but we tried not to do so. After that, we spent time reviewing names and promoting, uh, re-prompting to iterate in more and more shows. Some of them have over 200 potential names to consider, and many were bad and laughable. Uh, but at the end, each team selected a name for their AI show. At this point, it was time to move from the writing component of the project to the imagery generative aspect of the project. Um, and before doing that, we paused and we thought about design concepts that they had learned in other courses and within this one. We discussed the power of a picture and how stats shared by Netflix suggest that average viewers spend 1.8 seconds considering whether each title they're presented with is something they would want to watch. Um, and we talked about 
uh, image composition and things that they knew about other designs, themes, and imagery and how to use that language in their own prompting. I then asked them to take two approaches. First, in their Select Regenerative Image program, most of them are using Adobe Firefly here, to try to simply prompt it to create a title image based on the language they had already generated from the other programs. Then I asked them to use the other programs, the writing programs, to help them prompt uh, for image prompts. So this was right before ChatGPT4 and Dolly were integrating, and so most students didn't have access to that paid kind of image generation. And so we were asking ChatGPT to tell us how to write prompts for Adobe Firefly and putting all the tools together to see what we could make. We then went down the rabbit hole of prompting, revising, changing, and trying other image Megan, creators and so on. Yes, ma'am. The slides aren't moving. Oh, should... they're not. Okay, they should be. I'm sorry. Are we there? Is that moving now? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, we started week three with about 90 minutes to work towards completion of a more and a more unstructured week. So as we were recapping and debriefing the success and failures from week two, came into discussion that stu several students were building empathy for their clients through this type of work. Um, as we unpack that, they shared that as designers, they had always had something in their mind or their head um, about visual requirements for a project, but they were struggling to prompt the AI to get what it might be and what they were seeing in their mind's eye. This equated to moments of frustration with clients who weren't satisfied with something, but it could only really say it just doesn't feel right. Um, after that conversation and some discussion about how we might better guide clients through feedback and critique, I turned them loose to finalize their lockups and put things into presentations. At this point, they also realized the AI's limitations with text and the inability to spell correctly um, or to create fuzzy things um, and ghosted images within there. And so within reason, I allowed them some leeway to edit those images um, and to look at the tools outside. So they were to use the AI to prompt them how to make any design changes that they so chose. Um, so week four, we got to see their final series. And so here are a couple of the full works that we can look at in more detail. You can see I had one team who didn't follow all the instructions, but their um, example was still, was still there to see. Um, and so these were the groups, the pieces that were created over that four week time frame, and again, within class. I want to walk you through one particular project in a little bit more depth so you can see how the steps worked. Um, this is Fear's Labyrinth, which you see up here in the upper right hand corner. This is in their presentation. Um, this, the team picked to do horror. Um, through their process of elimination, they named their show Fear's Labyrinth, and they had the AI write the summary here that you can read on the page. One of the things that became really interesting to us as we were going through this process is we learned that with seven teams, um, the AI had named three personas and audience members Alex. Um, and so we talked about the lack of creativity and originality coming from this type of work and how we can bring um, something else to that space. When we looked at imagery, um, they were asking ChatGPT to help them decide and define and to write the prompts for their imagery. Um, and so according again to that model, these are the, the words and the, the concepts that it was coming up and producing for them. And then what they ended up finally prompting, this is some of the things that generated um, through those particular prompts. And then lastly, this was their final image and the final prompt that they used, a photorealistic horror, a spooky scene bathed in eerie moonlight, two figures in silhouette stand at the entrance to an endless high wall maze that leads to a rural town. Um, they struggled with typography. Apparently, labyrinth is hard to spell, whether you're a human or um, a bot. And so um, they blended, they asked it to tell them how to fix the type, what typefaces to use, um, which imagery to create, and how to design that final component. And so here we see their final or solution. Um, it was all very interesting as we had these conversations. Um, I think skeptical students remain skeptical um, and intrigued students began to embrace and consider the tool's potential. Um, I think we got to, if you use the AI, why are you doing so? How do you document your usage and give credit? How do you talk to your faculty or your client um, about using that along the way? And what are kind of the expectations and limitations? Um, and so I've had some of these students who in the next project were struggling to find uh, imagery or illustration and before would have sketched something or, or word concepted it to us who actually went to the AI and were able to prototype quickly something for a final project. I have um, some of these students again this semester in another course where they really needed some stock photography that just doesn't exist because it's not a real product. Um, and they asked if they could use AI um, to particularly create images that would be more appropriate to what they were able to create. 
Um, and so in the end, students shared uh, kind of the following feedback. They were overall pleased with the move to better understanding the tool that was out there and its current limitations. When I asked at the end of four weeks, how many of them were concerned that the tool would students take their jobs, zero, raise their hands, how many of them considered it more of a tool instead of a replacement? Um, many of them have looked at and considered it uh, moving forward. And so with that, I will end and thank you all for your time um, and happily take any questions about the project work. Thank you. <clears throat> no, thank you. There's a number of questions about clarifying for your audience here what the objective was for the class. Learning how to use the tool or learning how yeah. what happens with the content if they use the tool. That would yeah, be one of them. Yeah, so it's a brand development course. And so we were talking about more than just logo and identity. We had been doing um, things like looking at market research and analysis to create first projects. They were working on um, brand redesigns outside of class. And so this was an opportunity for us to see the tools as they were emerging right there um, as a way to say, you know, a couple of people like, but AI is just going to be able to do this for me in a few years. And it was kind of pivoted into, let's just try it and see what happens um, kind of an idea. And so that the learning objective was really to see what the tool can do for us instead of it being a replacement for us, instead of shying away from it, how can we embrace it and use it to further our creativity um, and the potential that we already bring to it instead of just letting it do the work or letting people let it do the work for them. Thank you. One of the questions is ChatGPT chose two names that are both ambiguous in gender, Absolutely. Kayla and Alex. I wonder if overlapping name choice was less about lack of creativity and more emerging rules given to the AI to try to better eliminate biases. Yeah, I mean, I think absolutely there's conversation I and mean, we talk about this a lot in graphic design and we look at stock photography and the lack of minority representation there. We were seeing some of that happen um, in some of the language and choices. We could kind of equate it to things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's just something for, for design students to always be aware when they're communicating um, whether or not it is the tool or them who are making those choices and prompting it to be to be that way. Did you find the students at this level of study yeah. fairly familiar with how to handle the tools that they needed to use with AI? Okay, uh, and then the second part of the question is, what do we do at the undergraduate level? Yeah, I mean, I think the same thing. I think I think about my graduate students, a lot of them don't have that art and design experience. And so it's probably the same um, in some places with, with the undergrads. I think for me, it's about looking at kind of what was talked about earlier, pedagogies and learning, like how do we teach them how to consider it as an option, not as the only option or the, the back end option, but how do we look at it to um, increase our creativity? What my students learned was that they could have conversations with the AI instead of it just doing, they could talk to it in some ways. Um, and in design fields, and, and oftentimes as students, we're doing so much individually that we sometimes forget that having a conversation with someone else can be helpful. And we can't always find that opportunity to connect with another person to get their time and their expertise. And so maybe in those places or instances where we are on our own to do something, we could have someone else or some other thing communicating and challenging our thoughts back. And so I think that that's applicable regardless of, of level of student. What did you... What did the students seem to understand about the copyright issues in behind this? Yeah, so that we got a little bit into that. Um, and so that's kind of where in, in Firefly, I think there's a little bit less that they're using um, things that are already owned or copyright or have some of that into it. Um, we talked about being careful about some of the other tools that are coming out and, and putting your work in there um, where, again, giving credit. And that's also a problem just in general, I think, in the field. Um, so it was it was challenging for sure. But we talked just about, you know, when you're doing it with a client, making sure that the client knows where it's coming from and why it's coming from there, but also really within classroom spaces, talking about how um, share with your faculty, you know, like you err on the side of oversharing, send another document that says, this was the prompt I used, this was the tool I used, this is why I did that. Um, and that was really helpful because most of them thought, well, I would either do it or I don't do it. Um, and so when they thought, oh, I actually could just tell someone that I did it and therefore it becomes more of a conversation. Did I do this correctly? As we're all still learning how to cite and credit and to be concerned mm -hmm. about the things that it's taking overall. Uh, Nikki is asking, why discourage students from editing the AI, editing, <laughs> editing AI-generated yeah. content? Yeah, that's a good, good question. I didn't really get to that. Partly because what the end, I also asked them, do you think you as a team could have created something stronger if you hadn't used AI or if you'd been allowed to contribute to the AI? And the answer was a resounding yes. Um, and so it was a great way to see that the tool could get us so far 
but that the integration of human and tool is going to become what actually generates greater and more unique content moving forward. So I think that was a, that's a great question. Um, and they looked at it from that perspective. And that's why I limited them um, because otherwise they would have just done it all on their own. And so it was kind of a fun challenge for them to only use this tool and to feel its limitations. Uh, this is a far out question to maybe <laughs> conclude the entire uh, okay. session. How long do you think we're going to be at this point of having to introduce yeah. tools to students yeah. before we start seeing them actually coming to Just us doing using it. the tools? Yeah, I have no idea. That's when we kind of were wrestling with, I think, overall, right? I mean, as it, it's iterated so fast. I mean, if you told me nine months ago that I'd be sitting here talking about this or even having done this experiment, I would have been like, you're crazy. We're not there. Um, and yet we are there. And so I think, you know, we're having this conversation, particularly with our undergrads too, like how do we teach design and principles? I think the conversation really came into those theories and those principles are there and the bus can't, like the, the generative AI can't do that or understand that. It needs to be told what retro is, or it needs to be shown a specific style. And that only comes from critical thinking um, and from understanding of kind of and studying the background. So I think it's going to be you know, a, a while, but I do think students are using it more and more, um, you know, spell check and all these other kinds of things or things we've used for a long time that are AI, we're just going to have to kind of adapt and have conversations. I think that transparency part that was mentioned earlier today by our keynote speaker is going to be critical in understanding and students telling us why. And more in, whoop, the question just pumped. There it is. <laughs> um, I know I've lost it. This is a different one. Yes, um, access, institutional access to Copilot or even using Firefly, a lot of these yeah. tools are um, bleeding our private data. Do you discuss that with the students before they actually start? We didn't, and that this was kind of like a quick, let's just see what can happen kind of tool. But I do think those conversations need to take place and will continue. And because we tried it as a tool, they've allowed us to have these conversations um, in other classes and other spaces. And then think about them as a larger, as a faculty, for sure. I want to thank you very much, Megan. I didn't even get to that point with Rollett, but thank you very much. Uh, thank we appreciate you. it. It is time for all of us to start moving thank to the all. next step. Uh...